In today's video, I'm gonna take you through the photography equipment I actually use to help me take better macro photos. Uh, if you've watched my channel for a while, then you'll know that I do macro videos both in studio, just like this, and outside in the wild. And on some of those videos, I'll try and be a little experimental, maybe using a new piece of kit or trying a different technique. But like most photographers, I have my core kit collection, those items that I use again and again and again. So in today's video, I'm gonna take you through what all of those pieces are and hopefully try and explain why I chose those pieces of equipment, why I use them and why they make a difference in my photos. So we're gonna look from the camera and the lenses through to things like tripods, lighting, even the bags. I've made a bit of a mess, so let's start by clearing this all out of the way and get on. So let's start with an obvious one, the camera. I shoot on the Canon EOS R5, and I did a longer video on exactly why I chose this camera for my macro photography, but it really comes down to a few main reasons. One, it's a full frame sensor, it gives usually better quality, better low light performance. And while smaller sensors do give you a little bit more zoom in on your subject, I don't only shoot macro, so I actually need this to be an all round camera for all of my photography. And certainly when I do commercial jobs, I'm definitely using at least full frame sensors. But it's also got things like image stabilization, which helps me get sharper shots. It's got an incredibly fast burst rate. It's got things like auto focus bracketing and crucially, it's got a flip out screen. And that has been one of the most useful things I found when I upgraded from my old Canon 5D4. This screen lets you get your shot all nicely framed up even when your camera is down on the ground. No more bending over and craning my neck to see what on earth I'm doing. Of course, other cameras are available, but this is the one that ticks all the boxes for me. On the front of it right now, I have got a Canon 100mm f2.8 macro lens. And this is pretty much my go-to for all of my macro photography. It's a beautiful lens, it's pin sharp, and that 100mm focal length really lets you get up close on those details. But because this also has built-in stabilization, which works with the in-body stabilization of the camera, it means that you can get quite rock steady shots when you're hand holding, especially if you're working with slower shutter speeds if it's not quite light enough. Now I've taken some of my favorite photos on my 100 mil macro lenses, but it isn't the only lens that I use with close-up photography. Other one is the 35 mil macro. Now this is actually part of Canon's cheaper range. It's much smaller, it's much lighter, and it only costs, I think about 500 pounds but it's 35 mil as opposed to 100 mil. So you're getting a much wider angle view. And sometimes I really love that because it allows you to get nice and up close on your subject, but you still get a lot of context of the area in which it's sitting. The great thing about 35 mil lens is that it is also one of the great general purpose lenses. So while I often use this for macro, it's also just a great one to have on my camera just when I'm going out and about or I'm traveling. So if you're only getting started in macro and you don't really want to invest the big money on a dedicated macro lens, something like a 35 mil is a really, really good option to go for. You can have a taster of macro photography, but you can still use this lens for all kinds of other things. While we're still on the camera, I'll just talk about a few other accessories. First of all, my storage cards. Now I used to use SD cards, but these days CF Express offers much, much faster read and write speeds and bigger storage. Now I tend to use OWC cards and these ones are two terabytes in size. So that means I can store a huge number of images on these cards, but also I can save them incredibly quickly. And that can be really important in macro, particularly if you are doing focus stacks. Now, focus stacking is when you will take many different photos, moving your focus point across your subject, so when you blend them together, you get a pin sharp image. But taking all those focus points can mean you're taking 100, 150 photos. And if you're using features like auto focus bracketing in your camera where you tell the camera how many shots to take and it just rattles through them, you are taking a huge number of raw files in a very short space of time. So that means you do need storage that can keep up with saving all of those images so you don't have to spend ages waiting for your images to write to your card before you can start taking photos again. Other quick note on the camera while it's here, straps. I tend to use Peak Designs ones because you can just clip them in when you want to have a strap and if I've got my camera on tripod and that strap is just getting in the way, I unclip it and I throw it away. Okay, so let's move on to lighting. 
Now this is a big one for me because I really focus on using lighting as sensibly as I can in my shots. And it's one of those areas that I've really found a lot of different macro photographers have a lot of different ways of working. And the problem is some will say that this is the way to do it and that's the, the way that professional macro photography has to be done. And actually the reality is like any art form, there is no right or wrong way. There is just whatever you want to do. So for me, I like working with flash rather than using continuous LEDs. Probably about 80, 90% of my photos, I'm using flash. The reason I prefer it is because it is much brighter and much quicker. You can freeze subjects in motion in a way that it's simply more difficult to do with LEDs because these small handheld panels typically just can't put out as much power as even a small flash unit but the learning curve is a little bit steeper when you're working with flash and you can't immediately see where that light is falling. So I have spent a long time both at home and out and about practicing with my lights and working out how I want to take my shots. And for the most part, I tend to use Godox lights. This one is the older AD200 Pro. It's a bit of a brick, but this thing puts out a lot of power, quite a lot more than typical speed light or flash guns that you would put on your camera. In fact, these put out so much power that I tend to use them in my studio as my main lights, only sometimes turning on these big AD600s if I really need that extra boost. But as you can see, it is just a big rectangle, so it isn't one that sits on the camera. And for me, that is crucial to lighting, getting it off camera. I don't like lighting things straight on where that light is just firing into your subject's face. It kills all the shadows, it kills all the mood. Instead, what I like to do is hand hold my light, moving it around my subject, making sure that that light comes in from a flattering angle, working with the light so that we get nice shadows. I try and light an insect in exactly the same way I would try and light a person, trying to find ways of really giving an emotional look to that light and shadow. And if your light is simply on your camera firing forwards, you can't really do that. But its size means I can just hand hold it, move it around where I need to, put it on a tripod, put it on a little support, even just prop it up on my back. And it's rechargeable, and I can usually go out on a few shoots before needing to recharge it. This one is the AD200 Pro, but I have recently got the AD100 Pro, which as you can see, is a little bit smaller and probably still puts out more than enough power than I would ever need to use outside. But you will need to use a trigger to let your camera communicate with those lights. And if you're working with Godox lights, then you will need Godox's trigger. Now this is the X-Pro-C because I'm working with Canon and this just sits on my camera and lets me control all the settings for my lights. I can pair lights up, I can use multiple lights in a setup and they will all fire at once when I press my shutter button when I've got this attached. I particularly like Godox's system because you can use the same trigger with all kinds of different lights. I can use this one trigger on camera to trigger the 200 Pro, to trigger the 100 Pro, to trigger the 600 Pro up here. It all works really well. And these lights are relatively inexpensive. I think this one's 300 pounds. I think this one is about 200. Even the big one up here, I think was only about five or 600 pounds, which is a lot of money. But if you consider the price of pro photo lights, we're talking thousands. So something like the AD100 Pro is a really great starter light if you want to start experimenting with using off-camera flash. But I rarely use the flashes by themselves. I always put something over the front of them. Now we would call that something a modifier, whether it is a large strip box like this, whether it's a big octa box like the one lighting me up here, or whether it's something like this. Now this is the MagMod MagSphere and this just magnetically attaches onto little magnets right here and off you go. And what this does is basically turn this smaller light source into a slightly bigger one, creating a softer, slightly more diffused light on your subject. Now with lighting, the bigger your light source, the softer that light is. That's why lighting me right now is a much larger softbox here. I've got larger ones here and I've got even bigger ones if I wanna craft beautiful soft light but you create soft lights by using larger modifiers relative to the size of your subjects. So that means that for tiny macro subjects, even a light that's this size is already relatively quite big. So you don't need to modify these lights too much to create nice soft looking light. Sometimes I will use mag mods and other times I will just use mini collapsible soft boxes that sit on the front of these. Now these were cheap, these were maybe five or 10 pounds on Amazon. 
but it just creates a slightly bigger light source and therefore helps soften that light. Lighting is one of those things where you can just start off with the bare minimum of kit and start to practice and see what results you get. But then as you get more into it, you can build up your kit, build up the different modifiers, experiment with how they create light and how they control shadows, experiment with moving them around using one light, two lights, three lights. I personally find playing around with lighting setups great fun. I love experimenting with that at home and I love taking what I've learned at home out into the field. Sometimes I will just use smaller lighting panels, LEDs, like this Xion 5 Ray M40. And this can be great just for adding a little bit of fill light if you just need that extra bit of light coming in. But these things simply don't put out the sort of power that the flashes do. But the great thing is that you don't need to use either or. Sometimes I will bring in an LED light panel to fill in some shadows, but then my main light will still be the flash. So if you've already got some LEDs and you're maybe considering using flash, don't think that you have to replace what you've already got. Everything can work really well together. The more you experiment, the more you'll find out you can do. Okay, I've waffled on enough about lighting. Let's get rid of this. Let's talk. Tripods. So this is my workhorse tripod when I'm doing macro photography. Now this is the Gitso Legend tripod and I'll be honest with you, this thing is pretty expensive. I think it's about five or 600 pounds, probably about $600, something like that. And that's because it's Gitso. They are a company who are famed for making absolutely indestructible equipment. And to be fair to them, this has been on all kinds of shoots in many different countries and it has never battered an eyelid. Not that it's got eyelids, but you know what I mean. But don't think you need to spend that kind of money for a good macro tripod. There are a few key things that you should keep in mind if you're looking for a macro tripod. One, look for one with a removable center column, like I've already taken this one out. Now that just means that your tripod can splay its legs extremely wide, and as a result, you can get your camera much lower to the ground. But alternatively, it is also a tripod that allows you to invert that center column, putting your camera in essentially upside down and getting it basically at ground level. And there are a huge number of photo tripods that allow you to do that. So just make sure that inverting the center column or removing the center column is an option on whichever one you're looking at. Beyond that, it comes down to personal taste and of course, budget. Are you gonna spend 600 pounds on a tripod? Are you gonna spend 100 pounds on a tripod? That really is only a question you can answer. Like most things, you do get what you pay for. More expensive ones will probably be made with carbon fiber, so it's a bit lighter when you're taking it out and about. And typically, build quality is better. As I say, Gitso do make very good stuff. This stuff is built to last, and as a professional, I wanna make sure that when I'm on location, I can put my trust in my equipment. If you're a much more casual hobbyist and you're just taking the odd photo every other weekend, you do not need to spend anything like this much money on your own tripod. But you're gonna need something to put all of this in. At the moment, I'm using this bag from a company called Naya Evo. I have zero brand affiliations with anything that you've seen here. This is just what I'm using right now, but this is a particularly good bag that I wanted to call out for a number of reasons. One, it's water resistant and made of sturdy materials. So that means when I throw it down into the dirt in the middle of the forest, I know that it isn't absorbing all of that moisture on the ground and inevitably ruining my kit. Two, it's comfortable because you're wearing it for a long time. It opens up on the back and when it does, it reveals a huge internal space. Now that means that I can reconfigure this to put my macro cameras in or if I'm maybe shooting video or if I'm on another project altogether, it becomes really versatile. Then of course, it's got places where you can put in your tripod and secure them in place, just like that. But the great thing for me with this one is that I can put another one here because I do frequently travel with two tripods because I shoot video. So. I need a tripod of me videoing me taking photos. So two tripods. But this is just a bag that I've been using and particularly like, but you can get the same features with bags from other companies, including Lowepro, Manfrotto, Mindshift, Toxic. There's loads. But like with tripods, it will just come down to how much you're willing to spend. But I definitely just make sure that whatever you're getting has got water resistance, a large reconfigurable internal space, and a way to mount at least one tripod to the outside. So that is pretty much the main equipment that I use. But there are a couple of little extras that I always make sure I've got with me. One of which is just pieces of bubble wrap. 
I usually take squares from packaging of when things arrive. And these are great because these are slot in my camera bag. And it means that when I'm out and I'm kneeling down in the mud, in the dirt, I've got something that is not only going to keep all that dirt and that water off my trousers, it's actually giving me a little bit of padding. And really, at a certain point, we need to look after our knees. I've known of people who take gardening pads out with them, foam, various kinds of things. And sometimes I've just used literally just carrier bags, shopping bags, just to kind of give a little bit of separation between my clothing and the ground. But we've all probably got various bits of bubble wrap lying around from when we've had things delivered. And so why not put it to use? This is the cheapest solution I found to any problem, but I found it really works. So I've always got some of these, usually shoved in the laptop compartment of whatever bag I'm using. The other thing is a spray bottle full of water. Now this is just for a fun photo effect, but I've used this in several videos to get shots where it looks like we've got lovely rain coming in. So I'll get my shots set up and then I just give it a little bit of a spray, add some of this lovely mist. It gives the effect of a beautiful morning dew. Now sometimes I will use that just with the natural light. Other times I will use it with my flash. Now if I'm using my flash, what I will do is have the flash behind my subject, but out of view of the camera. So that means that when I spray my water and I fire my trigger, that light comes in and it backlights all of this rain that then lights up in the camera and creates a stunning effect. So sometimes I've tried to add in like a rain effect, other times it has been raining and I'm just trying to emphasize that kind of watery wetness in the scene. But this bottle previously had some sort of hairspray in it or something. We've all got these things lying around. We don't need to buy new plastic bottles, reuse something that you've already got, wash it out, fill it up with just plain tap water so that you're not adding anything weird when you're spraying. But it's again another great solution to add a little bit of extra flair to your images and it costs essentially nothing. But that does bring me to an end of today's video. What I've shown here today is the core equipment I use, but like with all of these things, this isn't the equipment that you have to have in order to take macro photos. You don't need to use lighting. You don't need to use flash over LED. You don't need exactly this tripod or bag or camera or lens. The beauty of any kind of photography is that you can find your own ways of doing things. So what I'm hoping I've done here is shown you a lot of the stuff that I use to take photos as I do, that you can maybe take some inspiration from and hopefully use that to take better photos yourself. Don't forget that you can just start out with the basics. Your camera and your lens really are the only things you need to get started in macro. And then as you progress, you can build things up, add in a light, add in two lights, add in some diffusers, add in all these other little bits. But don't let budgets and shopping constraints stand in the way of you getting out there with your camera and having a great time. If you have enjoyed this video, then do please hit that like button and certainly please do consider subscribing to my channel if you don't already, and I will see you next time.